Good morning. morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church on uh, this last Sunday of the church calendar year. So uh, next week, I guess we get Happy New Year, right? Uh, Today is indeed the last Sunday in the church calendar year, and so our readings will reflect that as well as our message today in service. So I'm glad to have you here um, as we prepare ourselves for yet another year in the church calendar where we begin with our Advent season starting next Sunday. We have a lot of new things today, and I know that doesn't always settle well with Lutherans. So I thought I would um, give you a couple of heads up here to just make sure everybody's feeling okay. One of the reasons I'm just a minute or two late here is because we were strategizing in the back. Because one of the new things that we have going today is because it's a communion Sunday, we will be communing at the rail today. We are returning to rail... (laughs) So the Lutherans who don't like change are glad to change back to the way they were used to it. Um, But talking with the ushers, because we used to have four ushers kind of helping with this, and we were talking with exactly how we're going to do this. So it's going to be very similar to how you used to do it, which your ushers will usher the outside wings of the pews, that is the two far sides over here, up that side aisle. There won't be an usher stationed at the front to have you come into the rail, but you'll come up to the rail and stand until I welcome you to the rail. And then if you'd like to kneel, you're welcome to kneel at the rail. I will be communing with one elder up front here, one side, while the other side is either filling or dismissing. Does that make sense? So I'll be working on the one side over here, helping to commune this table. I will do a dismissal at this table while this side is filling up with people. And um, and then we'll move from here to this side and I will commune this side with the elder while this side is dismissing back to their seats and refilling. Does that make sense? All right, I know we've had some struggles with the other way walking through, so I just wanna make sure we all got this down, but. Um, When you are, we will not be using the common cup still due to the COVID protocols. We, uh, myself and the elders serving up front here, will still continue with COVID protocol with wearing a mask and gloves while we commune. Um, As you come up here, because I said there won't be an usher stationed up at the front, we're going to ask that you you use your own discretion and uh, your own willingness with distancing measures with people. If you'd like to leave some distance between you and your neighbor at the rail, you're welcome to do that, and please be, um, please be considerate of other people's needs as you come up and, uh, and try this. But we were anxious to get back to this one other time, and about the time we were ready to do it, um, we had sort of a, a surge with the Delta variant of COVID, so we, we withheld at that time, but we're glad to get back to this practice. We will still have two elders taking communion out to those of you who are unable to make it up to the front and back to your seats or those who are up in the balcony up there. So we still have two usher, or two elders helping with that. The other big change today, <gasps> two in one day. The other big change was you have your attendance card in your bulletin today. You notice the tables weren't parked outside the entryway doors and the narthex. So you've got an attendance card in your bulletin. You might even see some in the pews in front of you. Um, This was sort of a mixed bag on this one, whether we wanted to do this, because we felt like we were getting a better response on the cards when we had them parked in front of the doors when you came into church. We were getting about 80% response on on numbers when we counted people versus who was being signed in. Um, Statistics show that we're getting about 60% response um, from history when people fill them out when they have them in the pews or in their bulletins. But we've put the cards in your bulletins. We'd like you to fill those out you can do one of two things with them. Well, actually just one because we're not passing a plate yet, also due to COVID protocol. So I guess we'll ask that just one thing happens with those cards. Once you've filled them out, there is a wooden box at the back right between the two doors as you exit. Please leave your attendance cards in there. There's two big things that happen with the attendance cards. One of them is not as big a deal, which is one of the reasons we decided we could take them away from the tables out in the narthex. The first was that we had to try and keep tabs on who was with us in church so that if we had someone who had been exposed to COVID and was in the sanctuary here, we could notify everybody who was present with us that day. So it became imperative for us to have to track attendance very carefully through all that time. 
because we've had some time to, uh, to be vaccinated, if that's what people have chosen to do, and to try and take some uh, measures, protective measures for people against COVID, um, that hasn't been as important. But that leads me to the second reason, which was always the most important reason we kept attendance prior to that. And maybe you don't even know we do this, but within the Synod, we track weekly attendance, just numbers. We track weekly attendance for the churches across the Synod so that we can see different church sizes, and that's partially for um, voting rights, for district um, lines, where they draw the lines, how many um, communicant members exist in each particular district, each particular voting circuit. And uh, the other reason is we keep track of it so that we know that our members are staying in regular touch with uh, the Lord's body and blood, as well as the Lord's word, and they're in regular attendance in worship on Sundays and remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy so that if they are not, uh, we can kindly give them a nudge back into the Lord's house to receive his gifts. So those are kind of the reasons, and now I feel like I've lost all of you because I put you to sleep. But that's okay, we're gonna wake you back up in church when we get going here this morning. So let's get rolling with our worship services this morning with our opening hymn, number 508, we sing. <laughs>
Please rise for worship. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our service continues with today's intro. It's spoken responsively. We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. We praise you for your glory, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you who take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father, Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. 
Lord Jesus Christ, so govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that ever mindful of your glorious return, we may persevere in both faith and holiness of living. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 51, verses 4 through 6. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for the law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for the light of the peoples. My righteousness draws near, and my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from Jude 20 through 25. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. We stand as we join together and sing the Alleluia in verse. Alleluia, mortal home shall we go. You have the words of eternal life. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. <coughs> but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say, I say to you all, stay awake. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn number 663.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message comes from the gospel lesson you heard read just a moment ago from Mark, the 13th chapter. I don't know about you guys, but I have uh, all kinds of dumb things that keep me awake at night. All kinds of them. I could be thinking about a news article that I just read prior to going to bed, or maybe I'm rehashing things that happened at work that day, or maybe I'm thinking about what's going to happen at work tomorrow. I might worry about my body, maybe a little ache or a pain that I feel, or my health, or something that I haven't told somebody about my health because I don't want them to worry about me. She's not here yet right now. <laughs> I might think about my wife, my kids, my family, my extended family, their families, my church family, my finances. The list is a never-ending one. And if you're anything like me, you know what it's like, and I have said this before, that maybe someday, someday, I hope, to be able to rest without having to worry about all of this stuff keeping me up at night. What keeps you up at night? What is it that makes your head spin? Is it the worries? Is it the joy? The joys, hopefully, or is it the coffee that you drank after four that was a decaf? <laughs> I'm getting to that age now that I have to have decaf at that time if I'm going to drink coffee. I can't say this is the case from the gospel reading today because the text doesn't say it. But I like to think to myself when I read today's gospel that the disciples had things that kept them awake at night. Which is why they're talking to Jesus about what they are in today's gospel reading. In Mark 13, this lesson has been selected for the pericope for the last Sunday in the church calendar year for lectionary series reading B. The reading is really a subset of a much larger section that began at the beginning of the chapter of Mark, the 13th chapter, and it encompasses the entire chapter. We just get a snippet from the end of it as today's lesson but we had the beginning of it last week, and as I told you last week, our readings, their focus, and thus our focus today, at least for a couple of weeks, right here towards the end of the church calendar, of which today is the last day, well, those readings all zero in on the end. The end of time. A time of destruction, Jesus says. Tribulation and difficulty unlike the creation has ever experienced prior to this time. You may recall from last week's sermon, I was preaching on Mark's gospel, but I shared with you the parallel passage from St. Matthew, the 24th chapter, because I thought it gave a fuller picture, and I'll do it again today. Verses 3 to 8 from Matthew 24, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, I think it's because they were losing some sleep at night, or at least were about to, saying, tell us when these things will be. What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. They will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. That ought to be enough to keep the disciples awake at night, don't you think? What about us making matters worse? Was anybody in bed this last Wednesday evening around 8.53? Did you feel the earthquake? I felt something. I was thrown back in time to when I lived at Nebraska before moving here, and we lived a block away from the train tracks that got 127 trains a day. <laughs> we rumbled a little bit. The epicenter was near Williamsville, Missouri, about 12 and a half miles northwest of Poplar Bluff, Missouri. 
People here in Northeast Arkansas reported feeling the quake, as did people throughout Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And this quake was 10 miles deep beneath the Earth's crust. Anybody worried? Anybody stay awake for a while that evening, wondering what was going on, or was it just minor enough that it was no big deal? Or did you think about last week's lesson or in my case, did you think about this week's sermon and say, hey, there's a perfect thing for the sermon? <laughs> it begs the question, did it keep you up at night? Does the end keep you up at night? Because the signs are all around us. How many of us gathered here for worship in God's house today could honestly say that we have stayed awake out of concern for our own salvation, out of concern for the end. I'll bet more than a few. But Jesus' words here in Mark 13, while informative for us today to some degree, are really more of a response to his disciples' very specific query found in Mark 13, verses 3 and 4. They ask two very specific questions. One, when will these things be? And two, what is the sign when all these things are to happen? Jesus' answer to his disciples ends up giving them more than they initially bargained for. Because when you break down the full section of his response to them, it can be grouped into several distinct parts, of which I'll share a few with you. Jesus speaks of the specific signs of the destruction of the temple because Jesus was talking to them about the temple as he looked at it. So verses 3 to 23 in Mark 13 are specifically about just the temple, not for us. Then in verses 24 to 27, Jesus speaks of the coming in glory of the Son of Man. That one could be for us. In verses 28... In 29, Jesus speaks again of the signs of the destruction of the temple. Again, not for us, because that happened in 70 AD. And then finally, in what is the focus of today's gospel reading, Jesus responds to the question of when. But he doesn't just answer the question of when. More to the point, he tells the answer not of when, but of what the proper response of a disciple looks like. That's what we should concern ourselves with because that's how Jesus has chosen to respond to these specific questions of his disciples. And because I count you as his disciples. You are Jesus' disciples, so... If Jesus was to respond to his disciples in such a way, how should you respond in light of the signs that are all around us? Then I'm going to preach to you. How do you respond to the signs, fellow disciples? We, like Jesus, will not be so focused on the things like earthquakes, which is why when I was crawling onto the bed to take a phone call and be on it for the next hour and a half, and I felt it shake. I didn't get upset. I didn't lose sleep over it. Obviously, we can make connections to all kinds of world events that we see going around us, like earthquakes or famines or wars and rumors of wars. Love run cold. If you read Matthew's version, there are plenty of those signs around us, and it should be painfully obvious to anyone who's paying even the minute bit of attention to it that something's got to give. But instead of suffering bouts of insomnia over these things, we disciples will focus. We'll narrow our focus just like Jesus did on our response. And to that I might add what our response should be for those who are in the Spirit might surprise you to hear what Jesus had to say. Our response should be one of insomnia. Insomnia, you say? Not the kind of fear-induced 
insomnia like I mentioned I had when I think of these things, but instead Jesus says in verse 33, be on guard. Keep awake. You don't know when the time comes. Keep awake? What could Jesus possibly mean? Is he encouraging sleepless nights for his faithful followers like you and me? <laughs> Not literally. But indeed, Jesus has called upon us to stay alert, to be always focused and at the ready, which squares with the teaching from Luke chapter 12, verses 39 and 40. Jesus said this there. He said, know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready. for The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Here's a fun side note. In that particular passage from Luke 12, Jesus tells a simple parable, but he makes himself the thief. He's the thief coming to break in to the strong man's house. Satan's the prince of this world, and he's the strong man in that parable. And Jesus says he's coming like a thief in the night when the strong man doesn't know it to snatch away to snatch away his people. Satan, the master of the house, this world, and Jesus, the thief, the son of man, coming at an hour you don't expect. And Jesus is coming with intent to steal you back from the devil. He's done this by his blood, and he's done this for those who are rightly his, you, his disciples. But lest we meet, miss the point of this parable, which also squares perfectly with the teaching in Mark 13, that is, those of you who are in the Spirit, you too must be ready, awake, prepared. What does that look like? Does it look like wide-eyed in the watch of the night, never sleeping insomnia? Well, at this point of the sermon, it might be possible that some of you have drifted off. So wake up! <laughs> I've always wanted to pound the pulpit. <laughs> Surprise, see? It could come at any time just like that. And that's no joke what I just did right there. It's not a joke. Because one of the ways that you prepare and that you stay awake is that you listen to what's going on. You listen to the word of the Lord when it's being preached. You take it in. You learn from it. You change your life on the basis of it. Because through it, you're being led by God's Holy Spirit. And God's Holy Spirit is equipping you with faith to face the day. God's Word is not something for those who are sleepy, sleeping, even sometimes when it happens in church. It isn't drifting off for a little napsky in church once in a while here or there. It's a living, breathing, active word, Scripture tells us. Hebrews chapter 12, the word of God is living, active, awake and alive. It isn't drifting off. And as a living, breathing, active word, it makes you alive as well. It keeps you awake as well. Awake, alive, aware, active. And like the Boy Scouts, always prepared. Another way to stay awake is through active participation in the sacraments. Oh, for joy. We get to participate in the sacraments today, but before we even come to the rail, you've already participated in at least one of them. Indeed, most of us here today can say that we've been baptized into Christ. And where we have been baptized into Christ, St. Paul writes in Romans 6, we've died with him. And if you've died with Christ, well, then you will live with him. And so have no fear if the end of the world is near because you have already died and now are alive, alive in Christ. And it's not something you're waiting for the end of time for it to happen. It's already happened. You live with Christ now, through baptism. You've died and death's sting can no longer frighten you, and it shouldn't keep you awake at night. 
those health problems and worries and concerns about what's going on in the world. Fear of death need no longer keep us awake because we've already died. And because we've died and now we live again, that means we are awake, insomniacs of sorts. But then we've got today. We're gathered here in God's house for worship where we hear his word as the baptized but then we gather together as the body of Christ gathers on the Sabbath day, as is our custom, for the purpose of not only confessing our common faith together, but receiving the very body and blood of Christ as the body and blood gathered together as Christ. It's a proper preparation. And it serves as the perfect stimulant for keeping one's spirit active and awake. Prepared for the bridegroom, if you will, who's coming to claim his bride, the church. Friends in Christ, it's quite possible that you, like me, have lost sleep for all kinds of reasons that you've experienced the insomnia that comes from a lack of assurance in the midst of life's most difficult of days. I have no doubt that there will be more days like that for me, possibly for you as well. But enlivened and awakened by God's Holy Spirit through faith in what Jesus Christ has accomplished, that we've learned about through the Holy Scriptures that his death has been in your place. His resurrection is for you and includes you through the waters of holy baptism. Well, and I guess that means I don't have to stay awake at night. But I do have to stay awake. I do have to stay awake and be alert and understand that when these things go on in the world around, I can look. And there may be a day, even in my own lifetime, that I see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, just as he promised. But even about that, I will fear not. I need not lose sleep over it. Because if the slumber of death claims me first, I know that just as Christ rose from the dead, so too will I. And so too will you. And it's not just a distant and far off future, my friends. We get to see Christ even now. So rise, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we may greet the risen Son and remain awake as the psalmist writes in Psalm 119, verse 148, when he says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Insomnia? No. In spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ, which passes all human understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds and keep you awake in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as we make our common confession of faith in the triune God using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church, that God would give us grace to serve him with reverence and awe, granting us faith to endure to the end, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the pastors of our circuit, district, and synod, that God would give them the words to testify to his love for us in Jesus Christ and the hope that is contained in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the troubled in mind and spirit, that God would give them strength to cast every care on him and give them quietness of heart through a firm trust in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the lonely, that God would place them into the family of his church to find peace in Christ and fulfillment through loving service to their neighbors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of our nation, that they would walk in the ways of justice and truth using the power vested in them to protect the weak and the innocent. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those threatened by natural disasters, wars, famines, and troubles of any kind, for those who serve in military service or as first responders during times of war and in times of peace, that God would fill all hearts with repentance and humility to trust him throughout every circumstance, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are hungry, that they would be filled up with good things. For the poor and the unemployed, that they would find gainful employment. For the sick, for those we name on our prayer list and in our hearts and minds today, that they would be healed. For all those who mourn, especially that they would be comforted. And for those who travel, that God would watch over them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For each communicant gathered as the body of Christ here today, that with repentant hearts and faith, they would be worthy to receive Christ's body and blood this day, not to their judgment, but instead for their salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all these things and all others, we ought to pray into your hands, O Lord. We commend all of them, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated now as we enjoy a time of special music.
I was asked to stall a little bit so that Carol could make it back up to the organ as we sing the offertory, but it's a perfect opportunity for me once again to reinforce a little bit what we're going to be doing with communion because we won't be doing a walk through communion again. So I'll take the opportunity to do so. Again, your ushers will be coming down these um, side aisles, the center side aisle, and starting with the outside wings on both sides to usher those people forward. There won't be anybody standing up front as they work their way to the back. So as you see one table dismissing and returning to their seats, you'll know that's your cue to be able to come in and we'll fill the rail across both sides. Um, you will be filling on this side while I am with the elder communing this side over here and vice versa. Uh, as you get to the rail, I'll ask that you please remain standing until I come and greet you at the rail and I will say to you, Welcome to the table of the Lord. At that point, if you choose to kneel, you're welcome to kneel at the rail. I will then commune you. Again, we'll only be using the individual cup. And once we have finished communing across the entire rail filled with people or the entire, ta the entire table, then I will give a general dismissal to you, or excuse me, a table dismissal to you here at this table, which would then be your cue to stand and return to your seats. For those of you on the outside, down that outside aisle, once we get to this side, you will be ushered in from that center aisle. You folks are welcome to return to your seats up the center aisle. Same goes for you. You'll come up the side aisle and return to your seats this way after each individual table dismissal. Is that clear as mud? I think we'll figure it out. I think I've also properly stalled because I can see Carol sitting at the organ. Please stand as we join together to sing the offertory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. Will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and in the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. 
Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sin.
thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. Once again, welcome. I'll just, uh, I won't have you sit back down again. I'll just have one quick announcement and then I'll turn you loose and hope that you join us for a Bible study in between services. Uh, just the quick announcement was um, my wife said that there's maybe some confusion with the way I've announced our Thanksgiving evening service. It's not the evening of Thanksgiving, it's the eve before Thanksgiving. So the service is Wednesday at 6 p.m. where we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. Hope you can join us. That way you have your whole Thanksgiving day to do whatever it is you do, which I think includes football and turkey. Right? <laughs> so uh, have a blessed day and week in the name of the Lord and give thanks to our God for keeping us awake. Amen. <laughs>